Um, next, board members, we're going to move to our superintendent's report. Uh, superintendent Dixon, I believe next on our agenda is um, you're going to introduce the employee of the month, superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, board members. Uh, I am excited to introduce our employee of the month. So, Jeff, if you have our slide up. Many of you might know this wonderful, happy face of Yuriko Murakami. Yuriko has been with our office for a number of years, and she is a stabilizing for, uh, force in the Department of Special Education. We all love Yuriko. I have to tell a personal story that one, uh, one day in the parking lot, I was not paying attention. And as Yuriko was crossing the driveway, I almost ran over her. And um, she has not held that against me, but been nothing but kind, forgiving, and gracious. Um, so I owe her a great deal of gratitude. But Yuriko, uh, I will read what her um, supervisor said about her and coworkers. I want to make sure you have this word for word. Um, Yuriko is an amazing coworker, teacher, and person. Yuriko always takes the time to help train, find, uh, find materials and innovative ways to do a task or a project. Yuriko always has a positive attitude that is highly contagious, and I can testify that that is true. Yuriko knows the USBE policies and procedures and has never ending patience when it comes to helping others learn or understand them. Yuriko has a way with keeping track of so many different aspects of our department, computers, office furniture, software renewals, and general office supplies. Yuriko is wonderful about communicating if there are changes to processes, LEA contacts, and the status of materials. She can tell you where to find anything in our section, even if she's working remotely. The COVID pandemic was a challenge for everyone to adjust to, and Yuriko is an excellent example of how any job can be completed under any circumstance. She has dedication, kindness, and heart. I believe Yuriko is an integral person in our department. And that sums up who she is very well. I hope she's on screen. Do we have Yuriko on so she can wave to you? Well, if not, hopefully she's watching. So let's just give her a round of applause um, and thank Yuriko. And now we'll uh, move, Chair Huntsman, with your approval to our new employees. We've had Definitely. some amazing experiences hiring wonderful people. Hello, I am McKenna Powell. I am one of the new HR analysts supporting the State Board of Education. I am filling in for Michelle today. Um, most of our new hires should be on the call. Some did have some other obligations, but if you do see them in the hallway or anywhere, or just go out of your way to say hello and give them a warm welcome. So starting off, we have Joe Hubby, who is a fiscal monitor. Joe is from Layton, Utah, and previously was a R&D tax credit specialist for Markham Accounting Associates. Um, and I'll give all of you a moment to read the quote as I'm sure I cannot do it justice. Um, and um, we'll move on. Okay, sorry, there was a chat that just popped up. Okay, and so next we have Sam Yuri. We could just move along in the slide. Okay. Um, Sam is a school finance director from Payson, Utah, and was previously an LEA business administrator for Carl G. Mazur Prep Academy. Up next, we have Michael, and I'm so sorry if I pronounce this incorrectly, Hakarinen. Uh, he is a digital teaching and learning specialist, PCBL. Michael is from Maryland, was previously in instructional technology training for Utah Education Network. And then we have Jerry Rogers. Jerry is a fiscal accountability specialist within special education. Jerry is from Wyoming and previously was a financial analyst free for DHS within the Division of Child and Family. Oh, we, oh okay. Uh, and up next we have Nicole Vance. Nicole is a community program coordinator, CNP. Nicole is from Farmington and previously was a dietetic internship director at Utah State University. 
And hopefully, I hope if any of you are on the call, just wave and say hello. Um, I know that there uh, some weren't able to. Uh, Jessica Wilhelm, Special Education Secondary Assessment Specialist. Jessica is from Houston, Texas, and previously was an educational diagnostician. And Corey Erickson, uh, another fiscal monitor from Murray, Utah, and previously was the director of software license compliance for Novel Inc. And then Tyson Elfers is an IT analyst too from Grantsville, Utah, and previously was a software developer with Twila School District. I think we skipped one. Thank you. Uh, Colby Wilson is an IT analyst from Paonia, Colorado. Previously was a teacher specialist within Granite School District. And Matthew Lors is a public education hotline specialist from Maryland and previously was an attorney for PHBM law firm. Mark Rammels, a network engineer from Hawaii previously was a senior systems engineer for Direct Point 7. And Teresa McIntyre is an elementary ELA assessment specialist from Centerville, Utah, previously was a school teacher for Canyon School District. And we have Matthew Ricks, who is an IT analyst too, also from Utah, and previously was a software engineer for Select Health. And then we have Caleb Kersenbrock, who is a technical support specialist too from Kansas, and previously was a system admin too for Utah Imaging Associates. And Ephraim Zamora, education specialist, civil rights. Ephraim comes to us from New York City and previously was a director of strategy and innovation at WCF Insurance. Daniel Johnson is an SYS admin from Ogden, Utah, and previously was a consultant at Executech. I too like cake. Um, thank you for all of those who responded to us and sent us some lovely information and a quote. Um, we're so happy to have you at USDE. And like I said, if you see them, make sure to say hi, let them know how awesome it is to work here. Um, and if there aren't any further questions, I thank you for your time. Well, and, and thanks to all those that just joined the USB team. That's quite a good group here. Thank you for, for sharing. Superintendent, are you continuing on this or should I um, invite Kathy Jensen? That's, uh, that's under your purview, but I think that's the schedule. Thank you, sir. Well, well let's see, we have, well, before I do that, um, Brian, um, Quisenberry, AAG Quisenberry is going to introduce our newest AAG. Are you with us, Brian? We've got our new Yes. Chair, sure, can you hear me okay? Yes. All right, super. Good morning, uh, board members and, um, and, and everyone. I'm super excited. And, and Ash, I'll just go ahead and um, introduce you and, and explain a little bit about you. But I have Ashley Beal here. Ashley waves so everyone can see you. There she is. Uh, she is our newest uh, assistant attorney general. She started a couple of days ago. Um, and we are just so super and ex uh, excited and uh, happy that she's here and on board and, uh, and can start to meet some folks. Just so you kind of have um, a little bit of uh, idea of who she is and where she comes from, we were able to uh, uh, kind of appropriate her from uh, Las Vegas over in Nevada where she worked at, as a children's attorney project attorney at the Legal Aid Center um, out of Southern Nevada where she uh, represented kiddos uh, who had been or who were abused and neglected there in that county um, and so is, is well versed kind of in, uh, in the rights of children and has that, um, that experience. She was, um, among other things, named the Young Lawyer of the Year last year in the entire state of Nevada, which is very, very impressive. Uh, U of U law graduate, and so I think she was looking for 
an opportunity to come back here to Utah and found it. And when we interviewed her and, and met her, we just, uh, she just uh, hit it out of the park and was super impressive. And so, um, Ashley, I hope that's enough gushing for me to, to, to uh, share the impression that we're uh, just super excited to have you on board. She offices right next to me where Michelle Buse used to office. And so when we meet back in person, if you get a chance to, to drop by and say hi, that'd be great. Thank you, Chair. Hey, thank you. Welcome, Ashley. And we, we, I'm sure we're going to keep you really busy. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and I look forward to meeting everyone and, and digging in. And it's we, we, lose, we lose a lot of fantastic people from the state of Utah. And now it's now and again, it's fun to poach somebody from another state and especially someone with some some recognition like you just received. So I look forward to working with you. Thank you. You as well. OK, um, next we'll go to uh, Kathy Jensen, our fine arts education specialist. And Jeff, I think you're driving this, I believe. Thank you so much. It is great to be here with you today to share two kindergarten uh, images of aspen trees that were created by kindergarten students under the direction of Regina Stenberg at Riley Elementary. Then we have um, the last month been working on creating for you some way to share with you the other art forms, dance, music, and drama. Um, so a teacher, Corinne Penka at Hawthorne Elementary in the Salt Lake District used the aspen tree as a inspiration for student dance. She talked about the aspen tree having eyes. How does one look with their eyes to observe their surroundings? You can scan, zoom in and out, peek, glance quickly. What if you had eyes in different parts of your bodies? For instance, if you did a visual scan with an eye on your elbow, how would the rest of your body respond? So if you'll push play, Jeff, we'll watch this brief uh, video of students at Hawthorne Elementary dancing as eyes on other parts of their body. I'll just quickly ask everyone to mute because I'm playing the sound through my unmuted and we don't wanna create the ripple effect of the sound. Thank you. In uh, the coming months, when we return to in-person meetings, we will have still pictures of art forms with QR codes where you can explore the videos of the students actually creating those other arts. Thank you, Kathy Jensen. This, that concludes um, your presentation, doesn't it? Yes, thank you. Thank you. I, 
when I ride on the mountain moving cows or make trails or spreading salt or working on water systems, when I look at those beautiful quakies up there, aspen trees, I don't think I will, uh, I think I'm gonna see children instead, <laughs> instead of those trees. I appreciate, appreciate you sharing um, sharing this accomplishment, this accomplishment of student art. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, next, we'll go to our superintendent's report, Superintendent Dixon. Thank you, Chair Hudson and Kathy. Thank you for those aspens. Those are, uh, I have the same childhood memories of, of uh, actually dancing among the aspens when I was a child. So thank you so much for bringing that back. Well, we're off. January, here we go, off to the races again. And while a lot of students and teachers and all of us got a bit of a, a reprieve during the holidays, uh, you know, we hit the door running and learning, learning is taking place, but we also have some challenges. So I'm going to talk about both, both the joy and the great things that are happening and some challenges and then uh, end by talking about one of the projects that you approved and giving you an update. So first of all, um, I want to talk about uh, a couple of visits that Dr. Norman and I were able to make. And it's been such a joy to visit the classrooms and the schools of our board members. Board member Norton, um, you're up next. I'll be coming to your classroom soon. But Dr. Norman and I were able to visit Albion Middle School with Principal Molly Hart. And the culture of Albion is just so much fun. We were there on a day where they were having a competition for door decorating. So the first picture you see was a very um, creative and colorful door with a dragon theme. And of course the kids get involved in the decorating. And so the school was full of energy, uh, competitive teachers for sure, uh, wanting to see who had the best door, but just a lot of great ways to recognize kids and acts of kindness and um, just a, a wonderful student-centered culture. Um, we visited the classroom and uh, uh, there was a spontaneous play that broke out in the classroom of the dragons. And as part of it, I was able to pull a sword out of the, the uh, door and I was knighted. So I don't know if you can see this, but I was given this sword to keep, a bejeweled sword as part of the knighting and part of their play. Uh, but just a, a wonderful culture. And I, I credit Principal Hart for that culture and a student-centered approach that occurs at Albion Middle. A lot of great things going on. We were also able to visit Board Member Hymas at American Prep Academy, where he is a high school director. And I love that he just turned us over to a group of students. Um, he had the students take us to the classes where they talked about their favorite teachers and their favorite classes and all of the clubs that they're involved in. And of course, like any good educator would be expected to do, um, we interviewed the students about their experience and about their goals and their hopes and their dreams. And it's clear at American Prep that they work hard to instill certain characteristics into their students. Students were very respectful of each other and of adults and um, very goal oriented and it was fun to hear them talk about all of the things that they're involved in all of the clubs and the leadership opportunities that they have and the hopes and dreams that they have for their future many of them going to college for the first as, um, as the first members of their family to do so so um, both experiences as you would imagine were wonderful and I hope if any of you get the time to visit the schools of your college you will do so um, I do want to give a bit of a uh, COVID update uh, you know, you, you've been hearing from people, I think, uh, all through the holidays and beyond, I started hearing from schools, and especially this last week, about the rapid spread. Um, you know that I've been a part of the school health advisory group, and we've combined two or three different groups that are meeting on a variety of issues related to COVID. And so we had our first meeting this week with this combined group and just talked about um, the trends, the spread. Uh, this variant spreads a lot faster than prior variants. And so by the time we hit the test to stay threshold, we're seeing uh, a great spread already has taken place. And so based on that, we have a quarter of our staff out in, in many of our schools and a quarter of the students. And that is actually something that would trigger a school closure with other illnesses. So our, um, I'm hearing from a lot of teachers who are just 
really at their tipping point. They're uh, frustrated by, as are parents and students, by having to have a lot of kids go into a gym. They don't have a, a student. The governor mentioned recently that his own daughter, um, who attends a school here in the Valley, was at a test to stay event. And she was um, one of a very few kids in many of her classes, in many classes without teachers. So um, we're, we're at a, a crisis point in many of our schools. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and some issues. Um, one of the challenges with the test to stay, which is outlined in code, state code, uh, is the personnel. And you, you've seen stories, or maybe you've personally experienced long lines at testing sites. And a lot of those testing sites have actually been closed down to accom accommodate test to stay in schools. You have to get in the queue um, for test to stay, a test to stay date. And some of our schools can't even get a test to stay date until four and five days later. Uh, and by then the spread is, is quite rapid with Omicron. So there are also some issues with testing supplies. We've been okay up until now, but starting to run short. Federal government is actually sending some more testing supplies out, but they may not be here for a week or two. So um, the rapid spread, a lot of teacher um, absences, we can't get subs. I'll give you some data. I know Canyons earlier this week had over 200 um, uh, teachers out due to illness and uh, they couldn't even fill half of the substitute slots. So those, these are the real issues that um, have been happening in our in many of our schools, particularly across the Wasatch Front and a few in our rural areas as well. Um, I've been meeting over the past couple of days about 10 hours uh, on and off meetings and calls with superintendents, legislative leaders, governor's office to try and come up with some solutions. And we've had some of our districts already, already step forward who had Friday as a non-student day uh, based on end of term. Monday is a holiday and then taking an additional day. Uh, and there's a variation on some of these things and some are feeling like they need a little bit more flexibility. So a couple of the um, solutions are to, uh, uh, oh, and let me talk a little bit about test to stay as well. Um, some of the test to stay events, there was one in a district this week where um, it was 9, 30, 10 o'clock and they were only through the Bs. It's a large high school, um, but we, we had to, uh, I, I guess they had to excuse the state health workers or the, the local health department workers who were helping with the testing because they had an initial event in the afternoon that they had to get to. So there were about 25 school personnel that were leaning in, custodians, paraeducators, the principal, district office personnel, and five, they could only provide five um, testing personnel from, from the health department. So just even our test to stay is, has become problematic. So all of those things um, are coming to a solution for a reprieve over the next couple of weeks. A letter should be coming out shortly. I've been watching for it. It's not quite here yet, but it, um, it meets the demands of the law, uh, of the code that came from Senate Bill uh, 107 and House Bill 1007, which outlines everything that needs to happen for in-person instruction. And the letter will give a couple of weeks reprieve for people who meet certain, for schools who meet certain criteria. And I'll send that forward to you as soon as you have it and we'll make sure there's immediate release so that the public has it as well. The letter will go out to all of our LEA heads with all of the details. So hopefully that will give a bit of reprieve and try to get both the spread under control and allow for schools that are at that um, tipping point um, to make sure that they can move forward in using good digital tools and resources where they need it. So without going into too much detail because the letter is very detailed, I'll send that to you right away. Um, and then last but not least, <clears throat> I want to give you an update on the ESSER funds that you allocated for teachers. And we hope this will show appreci the appreciation you have for them as well. If you'll advance the slide, yeah. Um, remember that in December, you allocated um, $12 million out of the federal relief funds for um, the efforts of teachers in their classrooms. And we have this really unique and wonderful partnership with Donors Choose so that teachers can uh, um, register for Donors Choose and get up to $1,000 to meet the needs of their classrooms. And this would come in the um, space of supplies and materials. And 
creative classroom solutions that help address the impacts that COVID-19 has had on learning in their, in their particular setting. So with this investment, over 12,000 teachers will receive about $2,000 in funding to support these projects. And um, our staff under the direction of Sarah Young has been instrumental in setting all of this up for the teachers. The, this collaboration between the state board and Donors Choose uh, is the largest to date in the nation. And it really will provide our educators with resources that empower them to make decisions that they know can best support their students. This project will go live um, Tuesday, January 18th, and the teachers and school leaders will be notified shortly about the launch, and it will give them details about what to do. I've uh, been contacted by at least one foundation, uh, and some of them already work with Donors Choose and may even be able to come up with matches from businesses. So we're very excited about this project, and I'm just so grateful that the board is focused on ways that we can specifically help teachers during this very difficult time. So uh, unless there are questions, that completes my report, Chair Hudson. Okay, thank you. The way my screen's for, oh, there we go. All right. Um, thank you, Superintendent. I don't see any hands raised at the time. I'm sure we'll have questions along the, the way. There is a lot of moving parts right now in, in public education. To, Keep making it happen. Um, well, hang on one sec. I see a hand. Uh, Vice Chair Davis. Thank you. Could you just clarify for a minute that um, bottom statement on your slide that said that the test to stay protocol is being suspended during this time? Um, so could you just elaborate a little bit more on that? Is that's written in HB 1007, I think, right? Or is it not? Is that a health department initiative? And, and does that mean that like the districts or charters who are taking this kind of five day window then are not going to be doing the test to stay to, for students to re-enter? I've had some parents contacting me on this question. So I just wanna clarify and make sure I'm giving accurate information. Superintendent? Without having the letter in front of me, it's my understanding um, just in the draft letter that I saw that we are suspending tests to stay, <clears throat> excuse me, for a couple of weeks, just trying to uh, catch up out in the, the community with all the testing events in the community. And um, I, I think your question is if, does it only apply to schools who are able to meet the criteria and take additional days away from learning or is it statewide? Is that what you're asking, Chair Davis? Well, I guess I'm just wondering, are we suspending that for everybody? Or for example, if schools have a test to stay date scheduled, are those going to continue mm -hmm. to happen and then those protocols stay in place? Yeah, it's my understanding that um, any testing dates over the next couple of weeks that are scheduled will be suspended. But without seeing the letter and having that accurate information, I, um, once you get the letter, I think it will be clear. Thank you. And I will let me look, and then I can either put it in the chat or um, insert myself at an appropriate time so that you and the public have the, the accurate information. Um, Member Earl. Yeah, Superintendent, I don't, as you're on these boards and meetings and such, I'm wondering if um, they're reporting on more than just the testing positive, because we know that this is a quick spreading, spreading virus, um, which is not uncommon. But um, I'm wondering about the actual um, severity of students in Utah um, in regards to this particular strain. Do you, do, has there been data reported on that? Or is that something that when you attend one of these meetings that you would, would be helpful or would you mind seeing if you could get a hold of those numbers, um, which would be, I think would be important to, you know, get the full scope of this particular virus. Sup Superintendent. Thank you. So um, we hear from epidemiologists who work at Primary Children's at University of Utah, and they give us another variance based on how quickly it spreads. And by virtue of how quickly it spreads, then it can, affect those who are more vulnerable, adults, uh, those with comorbidity, et cetera. 
there have been a couple of reported deaths of children. Um, so just wanting to make sure that we have all of the data and we don't, you know, we don't get into the details of the epidemiology, but we, we do look at the numbers that are publicly reported, both at the school and county level and at the state level. Does that answer okay, so There's question? not really, um, other than people stating, we don't really have numbers on, on cases that are severe for children. Is that, did I accurately state that? Well, I, we don't see that data on the dashboard. So that's okay. something okay. that, it, yeah, that, it doesn't break it down by severity. It's just positive cases. And that's, I, and that's kind of why I'm asking if, if you're in those meetings, if they have access to that information, I think that would be beneficial. So that's all I'm asking if you're in those meetings and you're able to access that information. Okay, I will, I will right. definitely ask for that. I think, okay, thank you. I think it's also really important to know the, the lag part of the data as it, as it comes in from primary children than the rest of them. It's all about treatment and everything else. And then there's, there is a little bit of lag information coming. And so it's, uh, I know a lot of parents want real time information. That's what they're reaching out to me. Oh, do you have something? Do you have something? And I, I, I said, well, you've got to look at the dashboards and draw your own conclusions on that because we, we don't have any control of what's happening in the, in the different hospitals and clinics and, and those other places. So it's, it is, it is a kind of a frustrating time for some parents that, that are, trying to get all the information they can what's happening in in, a, in our state or in their area of the state. But thank you, um, Dr. Dixon. There has been, if I might just follow up with Vice Chair Davis. Um, so, you know, I'm okay. a friend. I'm already getting texts of people who are listening. Uh, it, it was our intent if we could, ar if, if arrangements could be made to suspend some of the test to stay that were happening today and tomorrow, especially tomorrow. So I, I think there are several high schools who are in the queue who have suspended test to stay. Um, how long that will happen? Probably for at least the, the coming two week period and then we'll see from there. Okay, thank you, Superintendent. And the, the letter has gone out to the first tranche. We're trying to get it to, it's coming from the governor's office. And it's going uh, to our LEA heads, and then we'll get it to others. So as soon as I get my copy, I'll push it forward to you, and and uh, Mark Peterson can release it to his through his normal channels as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your report. Uh, next, we'll go to our consent calendar. Board members, as you're aware, this is a time if any of you want to pull an item from the consent calendar. We have both actionable and then the other piece is uh, informational. May I ask a question? Yes. I, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to pull this up. Um, when I got on, I did not see any contracts. Are there, is there something there now? Th this was yesterday, so I don't, or early. Sorry, I do apologize. I just didn't have time to re go back over stuff. Mine, mine is turning on on my, I've got my screen split and I have access. Sorry, I have I'm the same issue. Again. Nothing showed up yesterday. I'm not, I'm only seeing stuff show up now. It is showing up presently for everybody. Could I, I guess what I'm asking is I'm, I need to just take a quick second to review because I there wasn't something there when I previously had looked and tried to review. Okay. Well, we can take a pot. No, if, you know what? Yeah. Let's do this um, because I know the driver and myself are we're, we're going to stay 100% engaged until lunch. Let's take a quick 10-minute um, recess. <laughs> I guess we'll call it. And it is, uh, let's try to be back here at 1047 and then we'll bring this back up. Okay. Thank you. I'll take a minute to review. Okay. Thank you. And I'll be right back. 